Joshua Graham, known formally as the Malpais Legate, and in folk legends as the Burned Man, is a character after a saint's own heart. He seeks redemption for the sins he committed while serving the Legion, yet his anger consumes him daily. Like the gauze he wraps himself in every morning, Joshua is a conflicted man, from his beginnings as a Mormon missionary to a legate and co-founder of the Legion. He now seeks to right his wrongs after the biggest failure of his life and second baptism in fire. Born in New Canaan, a Mormon community established in the remnants of Ogden, Utah, Joshua grew up in peaceful times. Due to his natural appetite for languages, he learned the trade of an interpreter. After he reached the age of becoming a man, he was tasked with a mission to spread the word of Christ, as was custom in New Canaan society. In 2246, Graham received the mission call for his sacred service, to spread the good word of God to the people of the wasteland. His good faith in God and knowledge of several local tribal dialects became the catalyst for a chance meeting with Joshua and a convoy from the followers of the apocalypse. Between 2246 and 2247, Joshua encountered this convoy on Route 89 while he was heading south into Arizona. Graham met Bill Calhoun and Edward Salo, who were sent by the followers to provide education to local tribes and to study their unique dialects. Asking Joshua about his past, he tells the courier, Things were more peaceful when I was growing up. When I was a young man, I went out into the world to do missionary work, as all new Canaanites do. I traveled along the Long 15 and followed 89 South into Arizona. Along the way, I met two men from a group called the Followers of the Apocalypse. Edward Sallow and Bill Calhoun. They came to teach the tribes. Calhoun was a good man. Edward was the one who got us into trouble down the road. Around 2247, Joshua, Bill, and Edward made their first stop in the Grand Canyon under the hospitality of the Blackfoot tribe. Joshua proved his capable linguistic skills with his interpretation from the tribe to his fellow pilgrims. However, at some point due to a mistranslation or an unrelated misunderstanding, the care of their host turned into hostility. The Blackfoots then decided to hold the entire expedition group for ransom. See, at this time, the clan was at war within the canyon, with seven other tribes, including the Kabibas and the Fredonians. This itself was not a problem for our group, except that it was a war in which the Blackfoots were losing, and Sala was not keen on being dragged down alongside his captors while tied up. There is no official record of Joshua's opinion on helping the Blackfoots with their war, but we can assume that he and Calhoun were not the headstrong, take charge type, and followed Sala's example at this time. We do know, however, that Calhoun is a staunch pacifist and urged Sala to avoid conflict. Against Calhoun's objections and Graham's naivety, Salo sought to take charge of the situation through force. Now Salo, someone integral to this story, is a man who will be feared for his cunning and ruthlessness later in life under another name, Caesar. No, not then. Back then he was just Edward. Smart man. Young, but we all were. We thought we could hike into the Grand Canyon and talk to Blackfoots. We did, and the Blackfoots were friendly enough at first. But eventually, I've thought back to that day so many times. I must have mistranslated. Something must have been mixed up, because the Blackfoots decided we weren't going to leave. The rest is history, assuming Edward hasn't changed it. Salo, born in the NCR with his mother and father, ended up in the care of the followers alongside his mother after his father was killed by raiders. Later, Salo was a student of uneven quality in his later years. His success in scientific pursuits was only equivalent to his interest in the given subject. In other words, he would only excel in subjects that he had particular interest in. He was not popular among his peers due to his explosive temper and narcissistic attitude. For him, the followers' devotion to scholarship and enlightenment was stifling and naive. This opportunity in the Grand Canyon where Salo refused to sink with the ship that were his tribal captors, was taken vigorously. Salo taught the tribe how to care for their weapons, make explosives, and work as a proper combat unit with Joshua serving as his interpreter. Inevitably, because of his ability to communicate smoothly with the tribe, Joshua became the de facto war leader of the tribe in this war. Under Salo and Joshua's tutelage, 
The tribe learned small unit tactics, weapon use and maintenance, and how to manufacture arms and explosives. You see, while the convoy was traveling south into Arizona, they happened upon a cache of pre-war literature. Two books in particular were on ancient Rome, specifically The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire and Gaius Julius Caesar's own Commentari de Bello Gallico. Salo became enamored with these books, reading them for two weeks straight before their encounter with the Blackfoots. Salo was not yet aware of these books' coming significance, not yet aware of the impact they would have on the western wastelands in the coming years. With Salo's teachings and Joshua's skills, the Blackfoots triumphed over the other tribes, forming the nucleus of what would become Caesar's Legion. Joshua soon became the commander of the fledgling army, leading them into battle. His leadership soon entailed retaliatory raids as well as terrorizing local tribes prior to assimilation into the Legion. On the precipice of a new faction of power, Calhoun was not long for the leadership of such a group. Salo tasked him with returning to the followers and informing them of what he had done, and what he will do in the future. I crowned myself Kaisar and created a single great tribe, my legion. I sent Calhoun, the follower captured with me back west, with a message that I should not be interfered with. Later that year, Salo crowned himself Caesar, with Joshua becoming his first legate, the Malpais Legate. For the next 30 years, Joshua helped Caesar conquer the tribes of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico, forging the Legion. Joshua was neither a particularly brilliant strategist nor tactically flexible, though he made himself infamous through his menace and brutality, an example of this being their first conquest against the Kaibabas. Salo, through Joseph, ordered that after the initial raid, where they killed anybody who resisted, all able-bodied survivors would be enslaved, and women and children of no immediate use be slaughtered and their bodies piled high in the middle of the village. Later, they would use child soldiers to draw out the empathy of their enemies, as well as categorizing women as if they were cattle to sell to the highest bidder. The atrocities he committed caused him to be feared by friend and foe alike. He was considered dangerous even by himself, unpredictable, and above all else, he was impossible to kill. NCR Rangers, an elite military outfit of the New California Republic, staged many attempts at assassination and outright direct conflict with the man, yet all failed. Five kill reports from the NCR Rangers from the first recon were delivered back to the NCR, yet Joshua remained at large. However, all great men eventually fall. For Joshua Graham, his fall was at the first battle of Hoover Dam. Caesar's obsession with uniting the wasteland under the banner of his legion culminated in him attacking the New California Republic in 2277. After a series of battles east of the Colorado River that included the destruction of Fort Aradush, later named Fort Abandon, Caesar's 68 tribes attacked the dam. The NCR was not willing to roll over and surrender, however, and held the coveted position of Hoover Dam against Caesar's full force. Joshua led the force into battle against the NCR's troops, who were led by Chief Hanlon and General Lee Oliver. The battle was ultimately lost due to a trap laid by Chief Hanlon in Boulder City, as well as General Oliver's entrenched soldiers at the dam. Joshua, while a man of great vigor, was not a tactician, and tried to rely on brute force to punch through the entrenched positions. His goal was to pursue the NCR rangers and sharpshooters who were picking off the Legion's commanding officers which sowed chaos and fear in his ranks. While pursuing, Joshua tasked his most experienced legionaries to track and kill the fleeing parties, which had fallen back to Boulder City. The rangers and army kept the legion force preoccupied long enough to allow the legionaries to enter the city. When they did, the Republic's forces pulled out of the city, and Chief Hanlon gave the order to detonate C4 and dynamite they had set up beforehand in strategic positions. NCR soldiers and rangers trapped behind legion lines had to be abandoned but Hanlon's plan had gone off without a hitch. The exploding buildings acted as giant fragmentation bombs, killing and maiming most of the legionaries and leaving the rest in shock. The remnants of this battle are explorable upon reaching Boulder City and the Mojave, where one can find the tattered ruins of what was once a thriving town. The NCR army and rangers executed a swift counterattack after the explosion of Boulder City, destroying the legion on the western side of the Colorado and forcing Joshua to retreat from the dam. At the same time, flanking attacks from the Legion at Camp Golf and other camps in the Mojave were similarly repulsed. 
the legion was forced to retreat on all fronts. Joshua returned to Caesar in shame because of his defeat. Then, to demonstrate that failure is not tolerated, even at the highest ranks, Caesar ordered Joshua be burned alive. He was covered in pitch, lit on fire, and thrown into the Grand Canyon for his crimes of leading the legion into the worst defeat in history. Caesar then promptly replaced him with a new legate named Lanius, and forbade his ranks from mentioning the name Joshua Graham ever again. This order from Caesar is known as Damnatio Memore, essentially the forbiddance of even the memory. However, Graham, like Caesar, was about to adopt a new name, though his title was bestowed by others, not himself. From henceforth, the Legion, and those who remembered, referred to him as the Burned Man. Joshua, burned and broken, woke up the following day at the bottom of the canyon. The fallen legate crawled in pain out of the northern edge of the gorge. Unfortunately for Graham, he was born with a natural immunity to Kim's, and despite trying, found that nothing could bring the suffering to a halt even for a moment. Finding old clothes in a nearby abandoned camp, he covered his wounds with torn cloth to help the skin heal. For Graham, his natural immunity meant that every day, the painful process of removing his bandages, cleaning his oozing skin, and rebandaging to prevent infection could not be eased. When the courier asks if there's anything he can do to help Joshua, he replies, You are kind to offer, but no, there's nothing you can do. We don't use chems, but I learned long ago that I'm immune to their effects. It never stops burning, my skin. Every day I have to unwind the bandages and replace them with fresh ones. Exposing my body to the air is like living through it again. But it's better to be clean than comfortable. Graham's footsteps, leaving a trail of fire, stalked the wasteland aimlessly. Day by day he suffered through a journey lasting over three months and 400 miles until he reached his family tribe of New Canaan where he was welcomed again like the prodigal son returning home. Graham retells his famous lines. I survived because the fire inside burned brighter than the fire around me. I fell down into that dark chasm. The flame burned on and on. The next morning, I woke up and crawled out of the northern edge of the Grand Canyon, that cursed place. It took me three months to reach New Canaan. It was as though the prodigal son had returned. They welcomed me like I had never left. Never done anything to shame them. The fire that had kept me alive was love. Their love. God's love. I will never be able to repay the debt I owe to them. But I must try. In Graham's eyes, the fire at the hands of the Legion was a second baptism that transformed him. The 30 years of separation, atrocities, and shame were irrelevant to his family. From his journey, legends of the burned man stalking the wastelands spread and eventually reached the ears of Caesar, who knew immediately whom they were speaking of. Since Caesar forbade the legionaries from speaking Graham's true name under the threat of death, it only enhanced the myth of the burned man. Caesar issued a kill order to his scouts and spies in the Mojave, Wherever Joshua was, Caesar's agents would attempt to seek and destroy him. For Graham's part, he decided to forgive Caesar, keeping with the idea that one must hate the sin, but love the sinner. Graham is very aware of Caesar's desire to kill him, and in light of sheer numbers of frumentari and assassins that have come looking for him, Joshua carries on. By 2281, Graham's past finally catches up with him. A raider tribe in the Zion Canyon by the name of the White Legs who were whipped into a frenzy and given weapons by Ulysses, attacked New Canaan while Joshua was away. Caesar gave them a task to integrate themselves with the Legion. He ordered them to destroy New Canaan, but Caesar only cared about the death of Graham and his family. The few survivors of this attack scattered into the wilderness, with the bulk of them seeking refuge in Zion Canyon. In order to defend them and the tribes that made their home in Zion Canyon, Graham assumed the position of acting war chief among the Dead Horses, a local tribe, alongside Daniel, another missionary and survivor from New Canaan. Daniel joined with the Sorrows upon fleeing New Canaan, who were another group of religious travelers in the post-apocalyptic wasteland. 
Daniel attempts to convince Joshua to fight a more peaceful, delaying battle against the White Legs, while the dead horses and sorrows evacuate Zion. This would allow them to escape into the wilderness from the White Legs. Graham, on the other hand, desired nothing more than to bring God's justice to those who bring senseless harm to others. This impulse was surely driven by the desire to bring vengeance against those who butchered his people. Killing anyone too slow to run away, the elderly, the ill, children, and even those who stop to help others struggling to escape. This desire burns in Joshua alongside guilt for his past sins and his longing for true repentance. Joshua warns the courier. The White Legs didn't just force my people out of New Canaan. They butchered everyone who wasn't fast enough to get away. The elderly, the ill, children, those who stopped to help the wounded. It made no difference to them. They can't be reasoned with. The White Legs. Daniel believes that if we leave, if the Sorrows leave, the White Legs will stop. He doesn't understand what this kind of tribe is like. Joshua only finds it fitting that he spilt the blood of his enemies in Zion, a natural temple and monument to the glory of God. Joshua cites the actions of Jesus in his travels to the Temple of Jerusalem and his explanation. Zion belongs to God and the people of God. It is a natural temple and monument to his glory. When our Lord entered the temple and found it polluted by money changers and beasts, did he ask them to leave? Did he cry? Did he simply walk away? No. He drove them out. It is one thing to forgive a slap across my cheek, but an insult to the Lord requires... No. It demands correction. Joshua Graham is a man in conflict with himself. He was originally a Mormon missionary from New Canaan, who steadily betrayed everything he held dear in service to Caesar. Caught up in survival between a tribe holding him hostage and their surrounding enemies, he slowly became a monster. Small compromises turn increasingly sinister and brutal, with Graham rationalizing them as making the best of a bad situation and doing what needed to be done. In the end, however, he and Caesar had built a society on a foundation of fear and brutality. Joshua's conscience was numbed by three decades of warfare and atrocities. Like anyone who has made the best out of their own bad situation, Joshua eventually believed in his own lies and rationalizations. But when the defeat at Hoover Dam came, he lost all momentum. Abandoned by the very friend he had sworn to conquer the world with, and the people whom he had trained to serve that friend, Joshua was forced to reflect on his life and face the monster he had become. Unlike most, Joshua chose not to blame Caesar for his situation, but himself. He journeyed to seek forgiveness from God and the people he had abandoned three decades prior. I have been baptized twice, once in water, once in flame. I will carry the fire of the Holy Spirit inside until I stand before my Lord for judgment. This concludes the history of Joshua Graham, the burned man. His life is a prime example of how the wastes are able to tear someone down, no matter their importance. What are your opinions on Joshua Graham? Do you think he is truly sorry for his past sins? Is he making the right decision for his tribe in Zion Canyon? Should he have helped Caesar originally, or should he have returned with Calhoun? Let me know down in the comments below, and while you're down there, why not like and subscribe as well, as it helps out the channel immensely. As for everyone who has helped my channel grow, I cannot come up with the proper words to express my gratitude. The channel has grown past what I thought could be possible three months ago. I also want to take this time to announce that I'm going to be taking a week off around Easter so that I can visit my family out of state and get further content ready. I am also excited to announce two new additions to my team. Ken Tuckles, who has been providing me with art for my channel as well as helping with scripts, and Paraconk, who has helped me out in the past and will be helping me further with editing and scripts in the future. I'm excited to introduce them to you all, and I hope to grow this channel further for all my fellow fans of Fallout. I'll probably resume posting again about a week after Easter, but once again, I could not have made it this far without all of you. Thank you. And with all that said, as always, thank you for watching. And please like and subscribe for more content.